there's some general rules in life that you just need to be aware of. One of them is this. If you ask somebody to remind you of something, they will not remember to remind you of something. Therefore, you shouldn't ask anybody to remind you of anything. And then you'll have better odds to remember it. A couple days ago, my, my wife and I were, were talking, and I said, hey, Remind me when I go to the store, I need to pick up deodorant. Now, there are a lot of things that you can get at the store that aren't necessarily essentials. I tend to believe deodorant is an essential. And so this, this is something that you really need, to, really need to move to the top of the list. Like, it's really important that, that you remind me of this because um, I want deodorant. A couple hours later, we went to the store. I'm like, yeah, we just, we just need to pick up something real quick. So I went into the store got the item, ran out of the store, made it home. Fifteen minutes later, looked at Brooke and said, I didn't get deodorant. She's like, no, no, you didn't. I'm like, thanks for reminding me. She said, how is this my fault that I didn't remind you that you ran out of deodorant this morning? How has this somehow become my fault? And that is the one advantage to having somebody remind you of something. Then it's not just your fault when they don't do it. Then you can blame somebody else. And I'm like, well, I asked you to remind me about it. And she's like, do you want me to go back out to the store? And I'm like, you are an angel. God has, God has blessed you by putting you in my life. And she's like, you really want me to run back out to the store? I'm like, babe, I'm in the middle of something very important. And she... She looked at me and she said, you are playing a baseball video game. And I said, but you could look at it as though I'm playing a baseball video game. I look at it as something entirely different. I look at it as making memories with our two sons. Because I handle the pitching and I allow them to take turns hitting. And it brings them much joy. Now, Brooke today is in the Lakeside Littles, so I just need everybody to make a quick agreement with me that what's shared here will not leave this room. <laughs> there, <laughs> there is a way to save the game and resume it. But I didn't volunteer that information. And so my wife, don't owe me, she is, she is earning crowns in heaven for serving others, all right? Who am I to deprive her of that eternal reward? How selfish would that be of me if I didn't allow her to do this? And so my wife lovingly went to the store and picked up the deodorant that, in all fairness, she forgot to remind me that I needed. So... <laughs> So, just, just want to throw that out there. There are times, there are times where if you're like, we really need to remember something, you're going to forget it. You're going to forget it. And we all have these in life. And oftentimes, they're, they're things that, that are really, really important. They're really important, but for whatever reason, they get forgotten. Today, we're, we're winding up our look at Titus, our look at Titus 3. And throughout the book of Titus, what we've seen is a reminder to this young leader in the church of what to be pouring into people, of what to help them remember, of what to, what to instruct the people so that their lives would look more like Jesus. And today we're going to wrap up our look at that. So if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along there in Titus 3 as we finish up our look at the book of Titus, where we read these words starting in verse 1. Remind them the people of the church, remind the people of the church to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. You know, generally, you don't need to be reminded of things, even if they're important, of things you enjoy. I don't know what this says about me, but I've never needed to be reminded when I go to the store to pick up steak. Never needed a reminder for that. That's just something that's natural. Yep, I'll, I'll grab steaks. I don't know why deodorant's another, another issue. Maybe that's something wrong with me. But generally, you don't need to remind people to do something that they enjoy. And here... 
Here's Paul telling Titus, you need to remind people that they need to submit and be obedient to rulers and authorities. And this can be incredibly difficult sometimes. For some of you, this is incredibly difficult right now. Because you're like, the last two and a half years of my life, I've been living a nightmare. For others of you, you're like, the last two and a half years of my life have been a breeze. Finally, this country's on the right track. And the eight years before that were a nightmare. And wherever you fall, for others of you, you're like, I don't care, whatever. And wherever you fall on that spectrum, you, you understand that sometimes this is a lot harder than other times. Sometimes this is something that you're like, yeah, you can, you can be a cheerleader for. And you're like, everybody support the president as long as it's your president. But as long, when, it, when it isn't the person that you voted for, this becomes a lot more difficult. In the time in which we live, everybody wants to make things an issue. And it, it's, it's, everybody is being torn apart And just listen to what we're supposed to be as people who follow Jesus. That we are supposed to be submissive and obedient to our rulers and to our leaders. That we are to be ready for every good work. That we are to speak evil of no one, even if we didn't vote for them. That we are to avoid fighting with people who disagree with us. That we, in all things, are to be gentle and we're to be courteous. So as people who follow Jesus, here's what I'm asking you to do. is just stop with the Facebook debates, please. I'm not saying don't post things that you're passionate about, but I'm saying other people are going to view things that you hold very passionate to differently than you do. And it doesn't mean that they're evil, and it doesn't mean that they're monsters, and it doesn't mean that they're hate-filled. It just means they have a different perspective. And rather than try to argue with them, try to listen and try to entertain their perspective. And instead of arguing, just please stop. Why? Because love attracts and hate repels. And if you look at our society right now, it is filled with hate. And it seems like everybody who disagrees with us has to be turned into an enemy or an opponent. And as people who wave the flag of Jesus, if we are guilty of this, it doesn't just reflect poorly upon us, it reflects poorly upon Jesus. And historically, people who love Jesus have been some of the greatest offenders about this. They want to argue and they want to fight about everything. And let's make sure instead that when people look at our lives, they see people who are ready for every good work. They see people who speak evil of no one, no matter how much we disagree. They see people who try to avoid engaging in fights. They see people who are gentle, and they see people who are courteous. Because the reality is, we want to win everyone to Jesus. That's our desire here. Our desire is to change this world by introducing people into a relationship with Jesus. And so politics does not drive what we do. So it shouldn't divide us either. And the reality is right now, a lot of people are making money off being divisive. But it's breaking a lot of relationships. And we need to make sure that as people who follow Jesus, that we are bigger than that and we are better than that. And we keep the main focus on being the best picture of Jesus that we can be to everyone, and that when people look at our lives, they see Jesus, not a political ideology, not how we feel about certain politicians or certain, certain pet projects, but instead they see us as people who are ready to win everyone. And if we're intentional about that, and if we really mean that, then we're going to try to win people to Jesus who look differently than we look. We're going to try to win people to Jesus who think differently than we think. And the beautiful thing about following Jesus is there's room for everyone. But they're not all going to look and think and act like us. And that's okay. 
But we need to keep at the main forefront and the main focus, not just as a church, but as individuals who follow Jesus, that this is what we are called to be, that we are called to be ready to do good constantly. That is what drives us, that we are constantly ready to support people and do good works, that we speak evil of no one, no matter how much we vehemently disagree with them, that we avoid fighting, that we are gentle, and that we are courteous. We are to be submissive and obedient to our rulers and those in authorities. And I'm sure the question is in someone's mind right now, what about Hitler? What about Hitler, Brian? Are we supposed to be submissive and obedient under a regime like Hitler's? Is there ever a time to rebel? And the answer is yes. There is a time to rebel. And we see this picture in Acts chapter 4. They were told to stop proclaiming the message of Jesus, the government officials. And they did not listen. So any time we are given an edict that clearly violates the teachings of Scripture, we're not to blindly follow that. But let's make sure... But let's make sure that when we choose to not submit, it is because it is so obvious that it contradicts Scripture, that we are not blinded by political ideology or personal loyalty. So the situations in which we should rebel against those in power are incredibly few. And incredibly far between. And they are severe. But that, so everyone could look at it and say, this clearly violates Scripture. Otherwise, whether you voted for them or not, whether you like their agenda or not, you are to be obedient and submissive. You are to speak evil of no one. Avoid fighting with others who who look at issues differently than you do. That you are to be gentle, even to your critics and your haters. And we talked last week, you're going to have critics and you're going to have haters. Just be ready for it. But make sure you live your life, as we talked about last week, make sure you live your life in a way that when your critics look at you and they try to attack you, their attacks are so ridiculous because they can't be founded and anything of substance. And make sure that you're courteous to all. For we ourselves, he says, were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. Welcome to America in 2019. And the question that I have for you is, are we still? He says, this is who we once were. This is what we were once all about. That we were slaves to various things, various pleasures. Passing our days, we were were just full of malice and rage and envy. We wanted what everybody else had. And we hated everybody else. And everybody else hated us. We were just hate-filled and full of rage, and we were angry constantly. And he says, this is who we were. This is who we were, but but we didn't stay that way. And the reason we didn't stay that way is when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. So we were full of anger and rage and hate, and we hated everyone and everyone hated us, and we were just walking through life as miserable people, constantly looking for everybody else that we could just hate on what they were doing and how they were conducting their life. But then God showed up and he changed us. He changed us at the core. And oh, by the way, he changed us not because of anything that we did differently. It's not because we somehow earned it. It's not because we changed the script in our life and then our lives look differently. No, God showed up and he changed us because God is that good. The goodness and the loving kindness of God, that God shows up with mercy and grace, knowing that none of us can measure up. 
And so I just want to encourage you today to allow the loving kindness of God to draw you closer to him, to allow you to become more like God as opposed to the fear of the wrath of God. Now let me be very clear, God's wrath is very real. And yet all of my friends who grew up with loving fathers have better relationships with their dads today than all of my friends who grew up with fearful relationships with their fathers who were constantly concerned about their wrath. Every single one. And some of you to this day, you carry the wounds of a dad relationship. Because you didn't get to experience that loving kindness. For some, you never even got to experience a relationship with dad. And for others, you had a relationship with dad, but you sometimes wonder, would you be better off if you didn't? Or maybe you don't even wonder that. Maybe you're convinced you would be better off if you hadn't had a relationship with dad. Because there are wounds that go back years and years and years. They still cut deep. And they have hurt you to the core. Because your dad wasn't a picture of loving kindness. He was a picture of anger. A picture of rage. And a picture of wrath. Now understand, there is, not, there is not this discrepancy that there can't be wrath that goes along with love, because those, those things are not mutually exclusive. Within God, they are both contained, and yet, understand this, what Paul tells Titus here is be drawn, be changed, focus on the loving kindness of God. God. God's wrath is real. But if you live a life where you're constantly trying to avoid the wrath of God as opposed to accepting the loving kindness of God's grace and mercy, then I would, I would say that you're going to have a hard time measuring up in your own mind. Because rather than living a life that is motivated in response to God's love, you're going to be living a life that is motivated trying not to step outside of God's perpetual wrath. And you're going to just convince yourself that you can never measure up. And oh, by the way, you can't because God's standard is perfection. And this doesn't mean that we just embrace God's loving kindness and then do whatever we want with our lives and just say, well, God's a God of love and God's a God of kindness, so I can do whatever I want and I don't have to listen to God's mandates. That's not a response to love. You don't get it. A response to love isn't, thank you, God, now I'm going to go do whatever I want to do because you love me. It's not a response to love. When you love somebody and you feel their love in return, you desire to bring that person joy. Be motivated by God's loving kindness. By the washing of regeneration. And renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Jesus has changed us. He's changed us. He's washed us. He's regenerated us. He's renewed us. It's like that feeling you get after, after a hot day out in the sun. We had our first yesterday in Wisconsin in 2019. June's almost here. We finally, we finally had a day where we broke 70. I mean, miracles do happen, but I've got little sunburned spots in some places where the spray on sunscreen didn't get evenly applied. And it was just like, wow, I'm actually hot for the first time in as long as I can remember. Good thing Brooke was so awesome and went and got me deodorant when I forgot it. See, it was going to come full circle. You just didn't know when. But there you go. There you go. It came full circle. Burning up, it was hot, and then you just come in, you're hot, you're sweaty. I am not somebody who likes to be hot and sweaty. I'm, I'm 
I just, it's not my thing. And so I just, oh, it feels so good when you get those clothes off and then you take the shower and you feel clean once again. And this is the feeling that we can have, that fresh, clean feeling like we've washed off all of, all of the sweat and all of the dirt and we've moved on and we're clean we're new. This is, what, this is the work of God that He's done within our hearts. He has made us new. He has made us clean. He has paid for our mistakes. And they have been dealt with by what Jesus accomplished on our behalf when He died on the cross for our sins and He rose again three days later so we could have a feeling of being new and we could have a relationship with God who paid the price that we could not pay. And this is the work that God is done within us. And it is a continual work that God continually does, that he continues to make us new. And he's given each of us who make the decision to follow Jesus, he's given us his spirit to come and reside within us that helps us in the choices that we have to make. That is within us each and every day. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. By his grace, we have a different destiny. By his grace, we have a future that is full of promise. By his grace, we have a future that is not absent of hope. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. And here we see it again. Be devoted to good works. Be devoted to good works. Last year, the actor Mark Wahlberg's daily schedule was released on the internet. And you want to talk about devotion. Listen to this man's daily schedule when he's not filming a movie. At 2.30 in the morning, he wakes up. From 2.45 until 3.15, he, he prays. Then it's breakfast at 3.15. From 3.40 in the morning until 5.15, he works out. At 5.30, it's the post-workout meal. At 6, he takes a shower. I'm just going to say, I would shower and then eat the meal. That's just me, okay? You do whatever you want. But if you want to sit in your sweat-filled, gym stank workout clothes when you've worked out for an hour and a half and then eat breakfast, more more power to you, but I want to get clean first. Uh, So I'm going to shower and then eat the workout meal. Then he goes golfing. Uh, Then he eats a snack. Then he goes into a cryo chamber for recovery. Then he eats another snack. Then at 11, he has family time, meetings, or work calls. At 1, he eats lunch. At 2, he has more meetings and work calls. At 3, he picks his kids up from school. At 3.30, he eats a snack. At 4 o'clock, it's workout number 2 for the day. At 5 p.m., he takes another shower. Now, see, this time he showers and then eats dinner. That's the way to do it. I'm not sure about why. Anyways, at 5.30, he has dinner and then family time. And then he goes to bed at 7.30 at night. That's the daily schedule for him when he's not filming a movie. That is devotion. I'm going to tell you, my alarm goes off at 2.30. I'm not a snooze button guy. I'm hitting the snooze. He's getting up at 2.30 to start that process. Imagine if we had that kind of devotion when it comes to doing good works. If we were saying, no, we're going to be disciplined about this. We're going to schedule this. This is something that we're going to hold to. So I just want to challenge you. Don't wait for random occurrences to do good. You schedule it and seek them out. Instead of waiting for the opportunity to just just come along for you to do good, instead instead of being reactive, try being proactive. And build some time into your calendar in the next week or month where you say, I'm going to be intentional 
about doing good. I'm going to bless somebody. I'm going to serve somebody. I am going to plan an opportunity for me to go do good for someone and be intentional about it. Be devoted to good works. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. In summation, he's saying, don't fight for fun. Don't fight for fun. Now, for some of you, that's just like, that's common sense. Who likes a good fight? And for others of you, you're like, who doesn't like a good fight? Game on, buddy. Like, you just wake up. You're just like, I just I woke up and today's not right because everything's going smoothly. I need to fight with somebody. Like, some of you just wake up that way. And if you're like, I wonder who that person is, your spouse may be pointing at you right now. So don't look to the side, all right? Don't look over to the side. But what he's saying is don't fight for fun. Just stop. Just stop. It doesn't end well. It may feel good. You may, you may get a kick out of it. You might laugh along. You might cackle a little bit along the way. But just don't do it. Don't fight for fun. Then he says this. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. As for a person who stirs up division, as for somebody who just loves to divide people, for somebody who loves conflict, who loves to fight, warn him once, and then a second time, and then just stop engaging. So understand there are times where it's okay to say goodbye. And there are times you just need to quit on some people. And I know that's hard to hear, and I know people think, well, is, is that really biblical? Is it okay to quit on people? Is it okay to pull the plug? Is it okay to say goodbye? You just go to Titus 3, 10 and 11. For somebody who loves division, for somebody who just wants to be a problem, and you know exactly who that person is. You've got them in your mind right now. Because again, they're the person who loves to fight. They, they just look for obstacles. They look for ways that they can fight. As for somebody who then just loves to fight and then gets people riled up and starts turning things into issues time and time again. They love division. They thrive on conflict. For those people, warn them once. Say, stop. Here's the deal. I know what you're doing. Stop. Warn them twice. And then be done. Because they're warped. Those aren't my words. That's what Paul tells Timothy. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Or Titus. So Paul wrote this letter to Titus, who was on an island, and he was working with leaders of churches, and he said, make sure that you instill these things with the people who follow Jesus. And so Lakeside, as we saw in week one, we have a choice to make. And the question is, are we in or are we out? 
When it comes to following Jesus, are we in or are we out? Because we can't have it both ways. And following Jesus doesn't mean that every choice we make is the right choice, and it doesn't mean that our lives have to be have, that we have to have our lives all together the moment we follow Jesus. No, the whole point is that Jesus takes people who are messes and He changes them, and that process takes some time, but we are instantly forgiven. But the process of becoming more like Jesus takes some time. But the choice that we have is: Are we in or are we out? And that's what we have to decide. Are we going to follow Jesus or not? And if we're going to follow Jesus, then we're going to have to do some things that we don't like to do. Well, that's the choice we have to make. Are we in? Or are we out? And if we make the choice that we're in, then we need to find people that we respect and we admire, and we need to to ask them, will you help me in this journey? Will you mentor me? Will you share with me your perspective? Will you help me? Because none of us are called to walk through life alone. We're a community. We're to be engaged in everybody's lives. You have a great opportunity for this. If you're free on a Monday night or a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, group signups are available now. Sign up and be invested in life together. And then we have an obligation to pour into the next generation. I can't thank you enough for how you responded. As last week, we just said, would you, would you help us? And you completely funded all the new chairs and all the new Bibles for the Lakeside Littles and the Lakeside Kids over and above your regular giving in a special one-time gift. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody who was part of that. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we believe in the next generation. And then let's make sure That our lives look like Jesus. And that what drives us is doing good, is love, is not fighting in opposition and focusing on what could tear us apart. But instead being driven that we would be a picture of Jesus and we would see people make the decision to follow him. This is what Paul instructed Titus to pour into all of his churches. And these same things are what need to drive us here at Lakeside. God, I pray that you'd help us be people who are full of love. I pray that we'd be courteous. I pray we'd be gentle. I pray we'd be devoted. I pray we'd be a picture of you. That you have changed us. You have made us new. So I pray our lives would look differently. God, help us look more and more like you. Help us pour into others in their pursuit. Help us make sure that others are pouring into us. And let us choose to be all in in following you. We ask that people would see you when they look at our lives. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.